All right, opposed to what our candles say this morning, we are on week four. If there's any pyromaniacs who are good with making candles work, if we could get that done before the Christmas Eve service, that'd be awesome because we need candles for the candlelight ceremony. So I invite anyone to fix those candles. All right, the scripture is coming from Zechariah 2, verses 10 through 13. We're also, our uh, New Testament reading is going to be from Luke 2, verses 1 through 20. This is the word of God. Shout and be glad, daughter Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. The Lord will inherit Judah as a portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord, all mankind, because he has roused himself from the holy dwelling. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was the governor of Syria. And everyone went to their town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I will bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were were just as they had been told. All right, so over the past couple weeks, we've been going through our anticipated series, and we looked at the anticipated Lord, the anticipated messenger. This morning, we're looking at the anticipated Christ. So these two readings both have this feeling of anticipation. We're just a few days out now from our culmination of Advent, five days away from the pinnacle of this Advent season. This Advent season, I wanted us to get this feeling of anticipation burning in our body. Like I said at the beginning of the service, this anticipation I get when those presents are all wrapped and they're under the tree. And like I said, I just couldn't wait. I had that anticipation. We had to open them. This was the anticipation that was going on during this time. If you're visiting or new or maybe you've been asleep for the last couple weeks, this anticipation is something that have been trying to get to fill this room, that will warm us as we walk out these doors. We've looked at the accounts of Old Testament and New Testament, of these examples of anticipation, of something that happened not just over four weeks, but years and years and years of anticipation. And finally, we're on that, that horizon where we can look out and we can see the coming of the Lord. We can see the coming of our Deliverer of our Christ, of our messenger. This time of year, you can't go to Sioux Falls, you can't go to Worthington, you can't go to a store and not hear those jolly bells ringing in front of them, those Salvation Army bell ringers. 
It's the sound of the season. Like if you could bottle up the Christmas soundtrack of what goes on around the Midwest, like that would have to be a sound, the Salvation Army bell ringers. One of my favorite things also this time is the music that fills the air. We go into all these stores, and it doesn't matter if it's a Christian store like Hobby Lobby or something in that nature, or Walmart. There's some sort of Christmas tune playing in the background. Now, maybe if it's one of those secular stores, they just take out the words, but we know these songs. We know that these are about Christ. We go on our cars, and we're driving home, and we flip on five different radio stations, and we can find these Christian songs playing across the air, these hymns, these music that, that filled our lives growing up, the soundtrack of Christmas. And that's because these are sounds of joy. The Salvation Army bells, these Christmas songs in the stores, in our cars, on the radios, these are songs of joy. That as we build up to the anticipation of our coming Christ, this is our soundtrack. And maybe you can mix in the laughter, the smiles of that Christmas time. Maybe if you grew up in the Spurlick household, it's always, always one parent getting mad at something. That's in my soundtrack of Christmas. But we have to have these, because with that yelling, with that chaotic Christmases I grew up on, came joy. That somewhere down the line, we appreciated. We knew what was to come. The joy of Christmas. I love these Christmas songs. I love the old hymns. And if you're coming to our Christmas service, we're going to sing a lot. So drink some water that morning because we're going to have like five, six songs and it's going to be a lot of singing because that's what Christmas is about. This joy of the coming Christ. Of all these weeks of Advent that we've been going through leading up to the anticipation of Christ to come now. And that's the joy that's going to happen on Friday. These songs talk about Newborn kings, they talk about wise men, stars of David, mangers, cribs. They talk about the very Son of God being born onto us and doing something that no human could do. This divine nature of God sending His only Son to us. And that's what we anticipate this morning. Even non-Christians walking into Walmart hear these songs of joy. So what's that mean to us as Christians? When even non-Christians, people who have never heard the good news, but yet get joy out of something that's happening. So how does that look for us Christians? I think last week or maybe a couple weeks ago, we sang Joy to the World. I don't remember which week it was. It could even have been this morning. I don't remember. But here's a little newsflash. We will sing this on Friday. So if you missed out, come Friday. We'll sing it and many others. That's my commercial spot for Friday today. This is a time of year that we literally can sing joy to the world time and time again, and we are. Because it's joy to the whole world. It doesn't just say joy to the Christians, joy to those who go to the church. This is a joy that literally this time of year spreads to everyone. And maybe some of those don't get what's happening inside of these doors come Christmas Eve and come Christmas Day. My friends who are, aren't very church, they say, man, you've got to do three services this week? You're going to go to church three times this week? I said, yeah, it's Christmas. I love it. I wish I could go seven. I wish I could go eight. I wish I could go twice a day. Because that's the joy that's happening in our Christian world. We read this morning about these angels coming to strangers in a desert and announcing the birth of Jesus. This is literally the first time we hear about the birth of our salvation, the birth of what is to come. And even at this time, the joy that was being spread didn't really have full effect because not everyone knew what was going on. We couldn't really grasp the whole thing that was at hand. But the key here is heaven was truly rejoicing. Something was happening in heaven, and those who are on earth didn't really understand it. Even as our New Testament reading, Mary couldn't quite understand this yet. Even Mary, who had just gave birth to the Son of God, couldn't understand all this joy that was going on. But everyone had joy. The heavens were overflowing onto earth with joy, it says. For the shepherds, all this joy was around them. And they're trying to figure out what was going on. The wise men we learned about, all this joy is going around them. And they have a job to do. And it's not to have joy. 
But something was happening. I thought a little about this this week, and um, Kurt and I were kind of reliving glory days of my high school state B championship. And that's a lot like what's going on. See, if you grew up in, in Little Rock or George or Ellsworth or whatever town nearby, it's a small town, just like I grew up in. Population 350. You can relate to what winning the big game means. It's not something that you just hang a banner up and it's over. When we played in the state championship game in 2002, uh, there was 10 people left in Stickney. Literally, like this is the rumor that they called the mayor and said, can we shut off the streetlights to save a little power? There's no one coming in or out of town this week. There was literally no one left in Stickney. Everyone had came up to the big game. And the game ended, and we had won, and, and the people rushed the floor. And I remember looking around, and I didn't know a lot of these people, and they're hugging and shaking you, saying, ah, congratulations. And for the record, I didn't play a minute in that tournament. <laughs> I'm five foot five, but I love basketball. So they're all rushing me and hugging me, and I can't figure out what this joy is. These people hadn't supported us all season. These people didn't make the six-hour drive to Mobridge, South Dakota, to watch us play. These people didn't go to the Corn Palace and watch us pack it for regions. But when we get to the state championship, they're all there. They drove all the way to Aberdeen. People who couldn't name three of our starters went to this game. And here they are, hugging and shaking and saying congratulations. They probably didn't even know I was on the roster, to be all fair. But here they were to celebrate something. Something that they knew was big. Something that I really didn't grasp my hands on right now. I couldn't understand the joy that was happening. But something happened. Because joy sparks this. Joy sparks something bigger than we can ever understand. The good news spread from this little town to another little town to another little town. And something special began to happen. The birth of Christ spread across all these little towns. And a lot of these people had no idea what this even meant. They weren't there when Mary couldn't find a place to have the baby. They weren't there when Mary was going through all these questions, when she had to face that she was pregnant and a virgin. They weren't there. They didn't know how much Joseph had went through. They didn't know family struggles of this family. But yet here they are for the joy. See, our culture today has taken this good news and we've turned it a lot. Now we manufacture and we sell this time of the year. And some great things can come out of manufacturing and selling. For example, all those little Christmas ordinance that have maybe a psalm or something written on them. And if you have a grandma like mine and she goes down to like Walmart and Sioux Center and she'll buy like 50 of those and give them to everyone she knows, she's taken an object of manufacturing Christmas and just made it spreading of the good news. So sure, there are some good aspects of this manufacturing of Christmas. But everywhere we look, every corner, every little place around town, even when you drive into to good old Little Rock, right there, season's greetings. Except for there's a couple bulbs going out there. They're town country members. We're wondering if you're going to get those fixed before next year. So, Anyways, even as you drive into Little Rock, we have this plastered season's greeting. We have the snowflakes up and, and lights on all over town. Maybe for some of us, we get joy out of that celebration of giving our spouses gifts. Maybe we get joy out of seeing our kids open those gifts. Maybe, maybe even some of you literally get joy out of finding the best bargain in those gifts. Maybe that's your joy this year. But it spreads, and people don't really understand how that joy started. But it spreads like, like a wildfire. We do things that, that truly bring joy. That something as simple as a baby lying in a manger, being born thousands of years ago, can still bring us joy because we know what that means to us today and going forward. That was the good news that spread like a wildfire. That was just like this disease, and everyone got it. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about this joy and this anticipation of what is to yet come. With that good news of Christmas, when we come in here and say, Christ the Savior was born today. The good news that will be pro proclaimed, not just on Christmas, but day after day after day after day. This isn't the joy, the same type of joy that we, we put over on like Christmas at noon when the in-laws come over 
And you're like, hey, Merry Christmas. That's not that type of joy. This is the joy that when you see my, the bulletin that Kim's working on, and I feel bad for her because there's so many songs she's going to have to type up. But she's joyful about it, I hope, because that's the joy I get, singing these songs and proclaiming that Christ was born today. That this is the joy that spread thousands of years ago. This is an outer joy that we get just because a baby was born. Not because we get out of school for 10 days. Not because you get off work for a couple days. Not because you got that present that you've been wanting for six months. But because Christ was brought to us. And something as simple as a piece of cloth in a manger in the middle of nowhere. This is the joy that's created when we realize, man, I need more than ever for that baby to be born. I need more than ever for this season to remind me of that joy. Because without that gift, I am nothing, and we are nothing. And that's what this joy should bring us. So what do we do with this joy? Sometimes, if you're like myself, I wish I could bottle up Christmas joy and like set it in my shelf, and then like when December comes around and you're sick of the Midwest temperatures of that cold, dry wind and the snow, and everything's just cold and yucky. I wish you could take that, that Christmas joy and sprinkle it on you guys. So you come in here in the morning and it's like, Christ the Savior was born. It's not just, hey, Pastor Dustin, how are you? Because you'll get that way. I mean, that's, that's how the season works. But I wish we could bottle that up and, and put a label on it, Insta Joy, or something like that. And have that joy, that Christmas joy, each and every day. Or in July, when it gets hot and dry and like you're sweating from the places you never thought it's possible to sweat from because that's what happens in the Midwest. You could take that bottle of Christmas joy and you could sprinkle it and you'd have that good attitude again. That man, I love these people around me. I love this gift given to me on Christmas. This baby wrapped in a manger. And that that gift on Christmas means more than anything. It makes me forget the sweat dripping down my legs that I don't even want to imagine where it's coming from. That's the Christmas joy. The joy that the angels shared something to the shepherds that day, to a group of strangers, and it spread across. They didn't just say, oh, hey, thanks, nice little angel. They spread this news, and that's what we have to do today. These shepherds acted. The wise men acted. They didn't just ignore the angels. They went and did something with the news. They said, yes, we believe more than anything in this news. We don't know what to do with it, but we'll share it. And that's what we're still called to today. Come December 26th, don't just forget the joy. Bottle it up and say, Christ came for me. That's what Christmas means. That's how this good news literally works. It's good news. It's not just like, I don't want to rip on the Little Rock paper, but it isn't like that little thing in the Little Rock paper you read and then you fold it and then you use it to spread the cookies out on. It's good news. You keep using it and you keep spreading it each and every day. It never gets old. Those shepherds in the pastures grazing their sheep, grazing their cows, went and did something. They went home and they spread this message of what happened. Is there any physics majors in here? None? Good. I don't know if I'll get this. Isaac Newton's first law was anything that's in motion has to have something to either set it further into motion or to stop it or something like that. Like that was the first law. There has to be something to happen. Some sort of motion to either stop you or push you forward and that's what Christmas can be. It can be that motion to say, hey, I need to stop doing these things. Or it can be to say, hey, I need to do more in my life. Now, I don't think that's what Isaac Newson, Newton was getting to. But it's the same for us as Christians. Something has to happen to either stop you or to propel you forward. I'm going to go back to my State B Championship story because I like to talk about this. We got home after that big game. We got back to Stickney, and we had this welcoming back celebration, and they sit you, and even the guy who didn't play one minute has to give like a, a speech saying, hey, thanks everyone. But it didn't just stop there. If you've been part of this, you go and you, you meet the governor. 
you go and you talk on radio stations, and we had like, Mitchell had this radio show, it was called like the Quarterbacks Club, but it was only like, I don't think a quarterback was ever on there. It was a huge basketball show. But anyways, you go on that, and you talk about all this, and you hung the banners in your gym, and if you're like the 2006 George Little Rock champions, you had a welcome home ceremony 10 years later again, celebrating this. It never ends. And if you're like me, you sit down with Kurt and you relive these moments. That's what the good news was about. It just didn't end there. Something kept happening and happening. And we have that banner in our life saying, someone came for me. Something happened. And through all this, it's something to keep celebrating. It's bigger than a state B championship. It's bigger than any game. It's our lives. And that's what the good news brought to us. Let us pray. (coughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you for the anticipation of the news yet to come. Lord, And as we, we look at our week full of chaos, of the things that are going on, the families coming in, the families going out, the travels, the gifts, Lord, let us focus on the joy of Christmas. The joy far greater than a a state championship, the joy far greater than that present that we've wanted, the joy even greater than giving that child the gift that they've wanted, but a joy only given through your son, a joy that we truly can't understand, but it's there. We ask these things this morning in your name. Amen. All right, we have communion this morning. And our communion um, will be, we'll invite people forward this week. So you'll come up around and we'll have three stations. So we'll invite you to come forward. If you are unable to physically come forward, just kind of give us a little wave or something and we will come to you. We want to make sure everyone gets communion. So if you are unable to walk forward, just make sure you let um, one of the elders know. All right, and also with this, we invite everyone, anyone, who in their heart feels like they can come up to this table. So if you feel deep inside your heart that you are welcomed at this table, come and celebrate. This is a celebration of the Lord's Supper. This isn't this sad moment when we think about this. But literally, Jesus wanted us, as often as we eat and drink, to celebrate this supper. Hear now the meaning of the sacrament. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Supper, which we are about to celebrate, is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill us for obedience in the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection and ascension he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of god and never forsaken by him we have come to communion with the same christ who has promised to be with us always even to the end of the world in the breaking of the bread he makes himself known to us as a true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine, in whom we must abide if we are to bear any fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge of the foretaste of the feast of love, in which we shall partake when the kingdom has fully come. When the unveiled face, we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory, since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained us through the life-giving Spirit, who unites us in one body, So we are to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. I'll invite the elders forward. Let us pray. Holy and right it is on this joyful day to give thanks to you in times and of all places. Lord, our Creator, Almighty and everlasting God, you have created with all of its hosts and the earth with all of its plenty. You have given us life and being. You preserve us by your providence. You have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into our world your Son, Jesus Christ, 
the eternal word, made flesh for us and our, for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of the heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. And in the joy of the resurrection, of the expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.